evening, folks. This is Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, bringing you another episode of The Inconvenient Truth, prepping for the mini Ice Age. Uh, our guest tonight returning for the fourth time this month, Anita Bailey, Ph.D., author of Cold Times. And we have a special guest joining us this evening, my partner and uh, the partner in crime here over at the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, Leah Shaper. She's a science writer who did her undergraduate degree in philosophy of science and physics and studied biomedical writing on the graduate level. While preparing for the cold times ahead at Oppenheimer Ranch with me, uh, she's also writing a book about the Grand Solar Minimum as a primer for the layperson in hopes it will inspire those unaware to take real changes ahead seriously. So uh, this is going to be a great three-way discussion with Anita because she has the encyclopedia on preparedness for the coming cold times. Are you there, Anita? I am. I'm pleased to be with you two. Awesome. Leah, can we hear you? Absolutely. It's great to talk to you, Dr. Bailey. Okay, let's, uh, let's uh, have a great roundtable discussion here. Uh, we're going to be discussing the last three chapters and, of the book, and we're going to have you back probably for some more roundtable discussions in the future, if that would be okay with you, Dr. Bailey. Sounds wonderful. All right, well, Chapter 10 is Health and Hygiene. Um, now, as far as preparing for the coming cold times, uh, the event that may happen, the grid failure uh, that will cause global unrest, many people are not prepared for, uh, well, let me just put it this way. Many people in third world countries are far more prepared than us because the number one thing that happens is health and hygiene breakdown, which leads to many waterborne illnesses and disease becomes rampant. These are things I know from historical information. So, uh, Dr. Bailey, if you could, for us, can you just give us a nice synopsis of the health and hygiene chapter and agree or disagree with what I just said? <laughs> well, I completely agree with what you said. The water system is one of the most uh, effective means of transmitting disease. And if you think back in history, it was a source of disease in many cities up until the, oh goodness, it would have been the early uh, 20th century. Uh, people were simply unaware that if they use a public restroom and the waste flowed down into the water table, it was going to come back up in the water table when they pumped up water. Uh, Germ theory helped make people alert to that, but it was also the product of the work of a handful of public health doctors who wanted to find out why cholera and typhus tended to break out in specific areas, generally around a water pump. So in the 20th century, my entire life growing up, I could turn on the tap and there was good, clean water that I had no concerns about ever drinking. Now, of course, over time, we learned that our water systems aren't as fabulously clean as we originally thought. But by and large, most people in the U.S. and, and uh, Europe, uh, parts of South America and other parts around the world, have water that is perfectly drinkable, usable for cooking and anything else. And so we forget. We forget that that is the product of a hundred years of people working to get clean water to you, to get the pipes in the ground and maintain them and make sure that the, the water as it is pumped into the system is, is somehow chlorinated or ozonated or sanitized in some fashion. And, uh, and then the wastes are removed away from where our drinking water comes from. The moment that system breaks down, we're seeing pipes breaking all over the country from the cold, you run into the risk of transmitting disease. Now, uh, you asked for the whole chapter, but I'm sort of focusing here on water because that is so, so critical to good health. Um, so that's why they have boil water orders when, when there's a, a pipe break because that's how you sanitize your water if you don't have... The, the chemicals and so forth in it that modern systems tend to have. Along with water, 
we have the whole deep issue of basic personal hygiene. Uh, someone who was in the military wrote, uh, I can't recall where it was, but uh, they had said the first thing that happens when you're out in country somewhere is you start getting boils because you can't bathe as consistently as you did when you're a civilian back in a city somewhere where boils are skin abscesses caused by bacteria, and they can be quite painful, and if you have enough of them, you can be very, very sick. Um, and that's simply from insufficient bathing. Now, typically in the modern Western world, we overbathe. We, we're kind of hyper-focused on that, and we've lost a lot of our healthy skin bacteria because we're washing it off every day, particularly if you have chlorinated water. So keeping good, healthy skin flora is a step in the right direction. And then any time there's an injury, any break in the skin, cracked fingers in the winter, for instance, or uh, cut yourself on something outdoors. It doesn't have to be deep. It doesn't have to be a, a tetanus potential, stepped on a nail or whatever. Even a simple scratch can get horribly infected if you're in a situation where you're stressed and your immune system is down and you're exposed to a whole bunch of new bacteria. Uh, in the book, I include a list of antibiotics. This is These are... Uh, the basic classes of antibiotics and, and their uses, they're not that easy to come by. Um, and the, the challenge for someone who doesn't have a relative or a close friend in the medical profession is coming up with those. So ultimately, I suspect people will turn toward herbal remedies. Um, our most favorite family uh, antibiotic replacement here is garlic. Uh, Garlic will, uh, it's antibacterial, it is antiviral. It tastes okay if you like garlic. Um, it's easy to get down in multiple forms, and it performs the function of different antibiotics in a healthful and very tolerable way. The primary difference between herbal treatments and commercial medical treatments is that they act differently, take longer to produce a beneficial effect. Uh, sometimes if, you're, if your physician or your healthcare provider gets you uh, antibiotics, you feel better after taking the first one. Most herbal remedies take much longer than that. Um, let's see, what else do we need to... Yeah, if I could jump in here. Um, sure. Additionally, a lot of people out there, the mainstream public, does, they don't, they're not unaware of herbal remedies or what herbal remedies would be effective. So what I'm suggesting is everyone acquire numerous hardcover books on information on herbal remedies, especially wild edibles, local to your region, and start learning to be familiar with them. Additionally, I would uh, suggest to look up fish mocks. This is uh, amoxicillin for fish, uh, fish tanks for those in the uh, aquarium business, and it's, it's safe for human consumption. There are studies done on it, and you could acquire this as a regular civilian in large quantities if you're preparing for an event where medicine won't be available. This might be a good antibiotic to, biotic to have on hand that you keep refrigerated. It's relatively inexpensive, and I know a lot of preppers um, stockpile fish mocks because you don't need a prescription to get it. Leah, is there anything you want to add about the uh, initial discussion on water or hygiene? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I think that uh, one of the biggest things that people need to think about is that we've been living in a culture for a long time where we treat disease instead of preventing it. Um, that's not going to be possible in the times ahead. I mean, to some degree, in, in, the, um, in the sort of old school sense, um, but... For, as an example, water, um, I mean, this is a tough thing. If you're in a populated place, um, you definitely have to think about, you know, boiling using iodine, filtering with charcoal. Um, you can also use um, small amounts of chlorine. Um, that's going to be um, critical to staying well because if you can't stay hydrated, you will not be well. Um, you know, and then there's other issues like the ones you mentioned, um, you know, herbal remedies for illness. Um, there's also lots of replacements for basic hygiene issues. Um, toothbrushing, for example, you can use um, 
you can use burnt eggplant and brush your teeth with that. And I'm sure that there's other solutions that I'm not aware of. I imagine you could probably use sand to brush your teeth. You can use sand to clean your dishes if you don't have water available. Um, and as far as water, I mean, one of the things that we've really prioritized is um, having running water on site because we knew that would be tremendously important. Um, and... You know, there's other issues like, um, and maybe we'll get into this later, uh, you know, medications. Um, if you can wean yourself off medications, do it now. Um, some people will prep for medications by skipping a few doses each month and collecting a stockpile if it's something that they really have to have. But, um, you know, from times of yore, people have found their solutions in nature, and there are endless solutions. Um, Dr. Bailey, you mentioned in your book, as an example, um, using white willow as a replacement for aspirin and as an anti-inflammatory. There are some other plants like that. There's a tree called the toothache tree that the American Indians used, um, and you just chew on this, and it basically turns your mouth strangely numb, and it's a weird experience, but it can be used like aspirin, and I'm sure there's other plants that do the same thing. Um, there's also things you can use for infection control. You can use colloidal silver. Um, you can use tea tree oil, which probably won't be available to you unless you're in Australia. But, you know, as far as natural replacements go, um, you know, you have to try the herbal remedies that work for you because my experience has been that some herbal remedies work well for some people and not others. Um, one example would be uh, valerian root is excellent for relaxation and reducing stress. However, some people it actually um, stimulates them. So, you know, trying these things, finding out what's growing in your natural area and what will work for you is pretty critical. And as Diamond mentioned, there are just, there's an enormous volume of books on herbal remedies that can be acquired um, and allow you to figure out what's available to you, what you can produce yourself, um, because we can't uh, prepare for everything. We can't stockpile everything. We have to be ready to produce the solutions that we need to keep ourselves well. Um, so those are all pretty important things. Agreed. Uh, uh, Dr. Bailey, let's talk about uh, the preparedness needed uh, in the in the mindset now we Leah just touched on it like there are lots of people out there right now and at, every day we go further in history more and more people are getting prescriptions there are millions of people that rely on prescriptions so we have all these people with heart conditions and other physical ail ailments that require prescriptions but my biggest worry for those that are in populated areas uh, major cities and suburbs are the amount of people that are on psychoactive medication. And now, let me just bring it out in the open here. The mass shootings we've had in America over the last several years have been perpetrated by people that are taking psychoactive meds. These are people that are mentally ill on medication that may or may not actually be helping them. And one of the side effects of coming off of these meds too quickly is suicidal tendencies, psychoses, and many other psychotic episodes. So uh, I can see in a grid down event, a quick, uh, it hits the fan situation where we're going to have tens of thousands of crazy people running around populated areas. What do you think? I don't doubt that in the least. And, and that, I, I think we have to differentiate between a total full scale breakdown. There's just nothing available in a gradual sort of wasting away of, of our resources and, and a collapse that follows that. Um, if a person is taking one of these psychoactive medications, and, and uh, they're so commonplace now, they're, they're passed out like candy, the thing you need to do is gradually wean yourself off if you know your supply is going to run out. Uh, you might want to talk to your health care provider the next time you visit them and say, look, if I'm in a situation and I can't get these, there's a shortage, or I'm stuck out of town or whatever, how do I wean myself? And the most common way of weaning off is to, to instead of taking your pill daily or twice daily, whatever it is, cut your dose in half. Take a half a pill or 
take it every other day or every other dosing time. And then after a week or 10 days at that, cut that in half again. And if your symptoms resume and become very severe, well, then you might have to boost your dose again and start the weaning process over. Now, this is not medical advice to anybody out there, but it's a rational plan that works in a desperate situation. We, we have to assume that people are rational actors. And, of course, people who are under duress and taking psychoactive medications may not be in, in a fully rational state of mind. That's why they're taking these things. They're depressed or they're anxious or whatever. Um, I used to, when, when I saw people in consultation, I would ask them, what is it about your life that makes it so that it's difficult for you to function without this medication? And most people can pinpoint it, you know, bad marriage or terrible job or financial stress or, you know, just had, had someone in the family pass on, whatever it is. I think once you are conscious of what it is and that it is okay to feel bad when you're going through a rough spell, it's okay. You don't have to be happy all the time. You just need to be functional. And sometimes you have to kick yourself and get yourself up and and go about your day and feel crummy and and be upset as long as you're not going to hurt yourself or hurt somebody else. That's now. In, In... a situation where things break down quickly, you got to do what you got to do. Leah? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I just, uh, something else I wanted to talk about that you just touched on, um, which is about managing stress. Um, let's be real here. When people are hungry and it's cold, you're going to be hungrier because it's cold, and chances are you're going to be hungrier that it's stressed uh, when you're stressed. So, of course, eating is really important. Um, and getting enough nutrition, but also, um, you know, things like thinking about, it's kind of like uh, when you're on the airplane and they give you the instructions for what to do when the oxygen masks fall, and if you have a young child, you put the oxygen mask on yourself first, because the reality is, is that you will not be able to help anybody else unless you yourself are taken care of. Um, and knowing your body and your mind are critical to that, and that includes your tr- nutritional needs as well as your psychological and emotional needs. Um, managing stress uh, also means, if you can, getting enough sleep and nu- nutrition. There's a very strong link between sleep and stress and immunity. Your immune system works the hardest when you sleep. So if you're not getting enough sleep, chances of getting sick and becoming stressed are very high, and stress also decreases immunity as well. Um, So, you know, being able to be, let's say, part of a community where you can deal with psychological losses and psychological changes and emotional changes um, can be incredibly helpful. I mean, we are social creatures after all. Um, And I'll also say to that that as much as it is important to be supportive of the people around you, it's also important that they're not coddled. Um, people need your support, but they also have to adapt if they're going to survive. Um, and, um, you know, this also ties into dealing with loss and dealing with death because, sadly, that is a reality that we all may be facing more than we currently do. Um, and so just kind of keeping all of that under wraps and keeping your immune system functioning well by sleeping well, eating well, stress management, which also includes making sure you find a little bit of time to do maybe some fun things or spend time with your family or do things that you love like art and music or any hobby or just play games with your family, whatever it is. All of those things have a huge impact on on your ability to survive in a difficult situation. I agree wholeheartedly, and uh, the best case scenario is that this event unfolds gradually. And it, the historical information and all of the things I've been looking at suggest that what is happening right now with crop losses is the very beginning of how it unfolds. So in the best case scenario, folks worldwide are going to see uh, rapid increases in food prices and uh, prices in items like batteries 
and dry goods, things that we need to start stockpiling. These are going to become more valuable very quickly. And if you're out there listening and this is what you see starting to happen, that is your cue to really make a move and to really start preparing for what's coming. Because once the crop failures cascade and the deliveries start happening, they're going to start shutting borders from countries and relegating the food within the borders. Uh, and hopefully this happens before the magnetosphere wanes so much that a, a solar flare, just a little X5 coming off the sun, doesn't fry the grid at the same time. And then you're talking chaos in that region of the globe, and that will probably cascade. If it's not cascading brownouts and blackouts, the grid will be down. And then you're going to have millions of people that don't know how to occupy their time because they don't have anything to stare at inside of this square. So stuff is going to get real very quickly. Anita, do you have something to add? You know, that is, is really my deepest concern about the, this coming time period. People can keep warm. Everybody knows how to put on a coat. You know how to keep your house closed up and, and uh, hopefully have some kind of backup heat. But if the grid goes down, all bets are off. They're just off because... There's no fixing this. There's no voting our way out of it. Uh, I wanted to touch on a, a couple of things that Leah said, which I thought was very good advice. Uh, one of the ways you can decrease your stress is by exposure. That's a traditional psychological method. If someone's afraid of snakes, you gradually bring them in contact with, with snakes, okay? Not that I'm saying you should do that, but... Uh, if, if we are looking at a time period where food may be short, it might be prudent to practice now going, say, a day a week without food or skipping two meals a day, say breakfast and lunch. See how your body reacts. Discover that you don't die if you get hungry. You might get cranky, but you can still function. You can still think. And you'll find ways that you can manage that. For instance, some people, if they fast for a full day, that is only drink water, they, they'll develop a headache. Well, if you have jelly beans, uh, a little tiny jelly bean, one jelly bean will resolve that fasting headache because it's generally from a drop in your blood sugar level. Something that simple lifesaver, sugar gum, gum with sugar in it, which, of course, we've all been told is a horrible thing. That can be enough to get you through to the next day. So having experience with things that are potentially stressful can take the edge off of them and, and uh, give you the assurance that you can handle things even if you're hungry, even if it doesn't look like there's going to be food until tomorrow. Um, back to the whole grid down problem, uh, there's a, a writer by the name of Matt Bracken who writes uh, modern thrillers, and he said on an interview recently, every morning that he wakes up that the power is still on is a good day. <laughs> and I've noticed that when I get up in the morning now, I look to see if the lights are going to come on, <laughs> if my phone is still working, um, and it's a good day. It's a good day. It's raining. It's dreary and miserable outside. The fields are flooded, but by golly, we got power on. I have what something I'd like that? to... Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Your turn. I was, I was just thinking that um, it sort of ties into both the grid down and the, the practice of fasting, as you were just talking about. I mean, this is all about... Um, it's essentially about practicing being adaptable and resourceful. This is not something that exists in our culture so much. Um, and, you know, as I've perused your book and, you know, continuing in our prepping experiences, and by the way, your, your book is absolutely amazing. Um, it's such an invaluable resource to anybody trying to get ready for this. Um, and I really appreciate its focus on community and, um, you know, the folks obviously on GSM in general. But... Um, you know, one of the most important things I think I did in the last several years that has informed my prepping experience 
um, is a number of years ago, I took a month-long winter hiking trip along the Appalachian Trail. Um, and it wasn't completely hardcore. I took breaks. Um, but I learned so much, um, not just about what was and wasn't important to bring and which materials would work and not work, um, but particularly in terms of having to adapt to things that could not be fully prepared for. Um, and I, I was with somebody else at the time, and one we did get into sort of trouble at one point. Um, it was winter, like I said, and at certain points we did not anticipate our calorie consumption, which significant, went up significantly because of the cold. Um, and kind of sat down and did some calculations about what we had left cal- uh, calorie-wise and how far we had to go and realized that we didn't have enough food and there was a storm coming in. That was the big thing. Um, so it forced us to make some changes and make some adaptations, change our route, uh, get off trail, and you know potentially get lost. But fortunately, we didn't. Um, but, uh, you know, learned a lot of things about, let's just say, uh, um, um, creative ways to stay warm, um, you know, all of which can be found in nature. Uh, you know, on really cold nights, if things were really bad and it was really windy, we'd insulate our tent with evergreen boughs. Um, you know, also keeping moving was really important for staying warm. Um, there's all of these things that can come up that force you to have to adjust. And I, I, I actually found it rather exhilarating, um, but it's also exhausting, and it's not easy to do. But that's a mindset change that, that has to come about, because we're coming out of uh, you know, a very rich culture where everything we need is available, and it seems, by and large, culturally, we've forgotten completely how to be uh, self-reliant and independent and not dependent on a system that seems to provide everything. So I think there's a whole... Uh, shift of consciousness that has to happen if you're really going to be ready for this. Um, you know, you can prepare and stockpile all you want, but being prepared for everything is very inflexible and a very impossible mindset, and it will make your life just as difficult as it would if you hadn't prepared at all. Mm-hmm. What a wonderful experience, hiking and, and discovering that. And I'm sure you found out things about your tolerance to exercise and Mm -hmm. discovered when you were really tired and when you just wanted to stop because you wanted to stop. So there's (laughs) there's a lot of personal information that can help you get through any kind of difficult situation in the future that, that you got from that great experience, which probably wasn't a lot of fun when it was happening, but now it's an adventure. Uh, in the same way, anything that someone can do to familiarize themselves with any of their backup supplies, if you've got flashlights and things, when's the last time you tried them? How long does the battery last in them? Will it go all night? Is it only good for a couple hours? If you haven't tried it, it's like not having it. And that's that uh, famous saying, two is one, one is none. Have backups for your backups. So, and then try that grid down experiment. Turn off your power on a Friday night and turn it back on on Sunday night. You'll know an awful lot about what's important to you, what you need to get through things, and, and what really isn't. What do you think, Diamond? Well, I can remember as a kid, we used to go camping in the backyard, and we and part of our normal play routine was resourcefulness exercises. You know, I would I would love it if my parents would just kick me out on Friday and I didn't come back till Sunday. I would go down to the pond and fish and light a fire and eat the fish and blow up the frogs with the firecrackers and then eat their frog legs. I mean, I would do all this crazy stuff as a 12-year-old that most people don't do anymore, stuff like that, and... I, I could survive and thrive as a 12-year-old because I read all the field and stream books, and that's just the type of kid I was. But what I fear is that m- the majority of people are not resourceful. They don't have any resourcefulness training. Uh, when we got here, we, we opened this campground out front here, 
And a lot of the young people, the 20 somethings, they come in and you could just see they're clueless. They don't understand there's bears that can eat them and mountain lions here. They just don't know what's going on. And so resourcefulness training, the way you describe in the book with the, the, the grid down scenario where you turn off your power, these are all things that are going to enable people to be resourceful and survive and thrive in the coming times because there's no way to predict how it will happen. But if you've tried it all, you're going to remember when it happens. Like, oh, remember when we did that? So this, these types of things are important. Uh, resourcefulness is the key to surviving and thriving. And for those people living in the suburbs that aren't growing food, you really should, this should be a wake-up call. Uh, you were just saying, like, uh, Anita, that people should try to, you know, not eat for a day or fast. Well, in a place here where we're growing food all over and it's abundant, that would seem ridiculous because why would we even try that? Because it doesn't seem like a possibility because we've set ourselves up in abundance so that that wouldn't occur. So thinking in those terms, changing the mindset is what people have to do, and that's like starting from scratch. It is, and it's a huge step. It, for people who, who live in our traditional culture, the way that, that we have created it over the past number of generations, it's, it's, it's crazy. And, and let me tell you a story. Uh, I was uh, presenting on my thesis for uh, emergency uh, management and disaster preparedness, and I was talking about the, the preparedness levels of emergency managers, and, and one of the uh, individuals who was um, uh, part of the audience was a professional radiologist with a doctorate, and I had a picture in there of shelves lined with food, uh, probably, oh, I guess a two to three week supply of canned goods and, and uh, you know, stuff like you'd see in a supermarket just stacked on this shelf. And uh, she didn't say anything until I was done with the presentation. I said, well, here's a supply of food that would be adequate for a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, for two people. And uh, she said, it looks like a food hoarder. (laughs) Here, I've just presented this entire thing talking about the criticality of having more than three days of food in your house, and this professional can't get past the programming from our culture. We never, we never look in our closet and say, I've got more than three or four pairs of shoes, so I'm a shoe hoarder. We never do that. But somehow food has become this unnatural focus so that if you have set back, like our ancestors did for thousands of years, there's something wrong with you by the cultural norm. So that's, breaking through that step is very, very difficult. Uh, And I want to say, if you've got two to three weeks of food, you are not a food hoarder. You're not even up to Boy Scout level yet. (laughs) Yeah, you're barely prepared. The average suburban house has more video games than they do boxes of um, pasta, and that is insane. Everyone should have 100 boxes of pasta and three video games, not 100 video games and three boxes of pasta. (laughs) You know, I want to add, too, that it gets a little worse than that. I I think it's not only a, a, a a consciousness problem, But it's also an ignorance problem. Um, I've noticed uh, sometimes people, when we're talking about prepping, um, sometimes people will say things like, well, what are you going to do when the stores are closed and you can't get um, bagged feedstuffs for your animals? (laughs) And, and, And it turns out that they don't actually know um, that A, you can grow the food that your farm animals are going to eat, um, and you should because you're going to have to rely on that. Uh, plus, it's cheaper and will save you money that you can use for other things for your prepping. And they also don't know that those plants produce seed. So we've also gotten that question, well, what are you going to do when there's no stores to buy the seed for the crops you want to plant? 
<laughs> so there's a real, like a very serious education problem uh, uh, here that that I, I really hope people can get past. And, 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 you know, all you have to do is think for a minute. You know, a plant reproduces like any other animal. Um, and I, I hope I'm not being obnoxious here. I have had the benefit of having a fabulous education, and that's not true for most people. Um, but, you know, and, and that goes, too, for the, the question of, um, you know, finding, let's say, replacements in nature for any of your health concerns or anything else that you might eat or even, you know, for thread or just other things that you need. Uh, you know, it just all goes back to this mindset of like, well, what else is it that I can use? And can I experiment with the things that are around me to find something that will work? Can I be inventive and creative and flexible? Um, so, you know, I, 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 and I just hope that perhaps that that pulls people out of their ignorance a little bit if they can just move in that direction psychologically. Mm-hmm. There's even a psychological term for that modern state of mind. It's called functional fixedness, functional fixedness, that we get a picture of some object and it has a single function. That function is fixed. So say uh, a cup full of liquid on the counter is good for nothing except for holding that liquid. We have wine glasses for wine. We have coffee cups for coffee. We have mugs for our tea. And <laughs> can't have your tea in a wine glass because it's functionally fixed. This is one of the things when you know, people are in situations like they're, they're in some setting where they're being attacked, they, they don't look at their entire environment around them and say, what can I use to fend off this attacker? Are there rocks here? Can I use that cup on my counter to throw at somebody? And uh, functional fixedness traps us in specific behaviors. Now, I have a theory about that, if you'd like to hear. Absolutely. Um, Okay. I think it comes out of advertising. And we've been exposed to advertising thousands, millions of ads throughout our lives. And whenever there is a need, advertisers try to uh, force a particular product onto us to fulfill that need. So we, we have been trained to think there is a specific item for this specific need. And that helps sell the product. It's a good thing if you're a marketer, you're trying to sell something. Not so good if you're a human being living in a natural environment where you look around and you go, what do I have here that I can make into a living space? Um, People who, uh, overnight campers out in the outdoors, We'll bring a tent with them. They'll bring a nice soft mattress to sleep on, a little thing so they can light a fire and so forth. Functional fixedness. Can you go into that environment with your clothes and a knife and generate what you need in order to live? And most of us can't do it because we're trapped in our mental models. There's a YouTube, and I wish I could remember the name, but it's some young man who goes out with a knife and, and builds himself a hut and, and uh, gets a fire going and does all of these things. Because if you have your brain intact and you have the capacity to step out of that model, the natural environment is filled with things that will meet your basic needs. Leah, do you find that to be the case? Absolutely. I absolutely do. And, um, you know, the description of, you know, advertising as part to blame, being to blame for this, it makes perfect sense because you're, you know, you're, you're selling a product and what you're telling the consumer is that you as the manufacturer are the only, this is the only thing that can satisfy your need for something. Um, and I think that that just becomes contagious. Um, but certainly, um, I mean, what you just described about finding what you need in nature, um, you know, the moments of having to improvise, let's say, on this long hiking trip, and by the way, I recommend this to anybody that's um, trying to get ready um, for the cold times ahead, because um, it definitely uh, provided me with a lot of knowledge. Um, but the moments where we had to improvise were, to me, were the most um, satisfying and the most thrilling, and what a, a sense of accomplishment that that brings to find a solution on the fly. 
Um, and, and it definitely gives some confidence in your ability to do that in the future, and it gets you out of the mindset of, oh, no, what am I going to do because I no longer have, you know, my whatever, whatever it is that, is you, that you feel you need at that moment. I definitely agree with that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So what we need is to be training in resourcefulness, however that may be for you, and we've got some great ideas. Take a, a multi-day hike on a camping trail. Even if you never camped, you got to start by camping. Um, that will get you to learn how to maybe even – and while you're camping, don't go to uh, Sonic or McDonald's. Buy a camp stove and learn how to cook uh, with a small propane tank. Learn how to rehydrate uh, maybe MREs or, or prepping food that you have already – Stockpiled. Learn how to rehydrate beans while you're on this camp trip. Uh, learn how to do it with uh, water you filtered from the creek at the campsite. These are all ways you can practice uh, resiliency uh, and effectiveness. Maybe you don't go with anything. You just go with a knife and a couple items you find in your garage. Make it a make it like a, a scavenger hunt, so to speak, where you just to bring a pile of stuff and you see what you can do with it. A couple tarps. Don't even buy a tent. See if you can make a survival hut. There are many things you can do to learn how to be more resilient in the coming times. There is no way to predict the way it will unfold, but the more life experience you have, uh, I love what Ice Age Farmer said. He said, you should be so confident in your skill set that when you wake up and your house is missing because it blew away, you just start building another one. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you know, I, I want to say, too, that, that this mindset I feel like is particularly important for anybody who might be stuck in the city. Um, you know, if you're, gonna, if, you're, if you're in the city and um, let's say you're prepping and you can't leave right now, um, you know, let's say there's a SHTF uh, event, um, you know, for one, uh, get out. Well, but don't get out immediately because if, 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 um, and, and maybe this is more of a conversation about security, which maybe we'll talk about later, but, um, um you know, every, if you live in a place with a regular rush hour, on a regular day, you can't get out at rush hour. There is no way you're going to get out and survive in such a situation because everybody will be leaving at the same time. Um, and so it's really important to think about that. Um, take only what is reasonable for you to carry. And I'm not talking about, you know, 40 pounds on your back like you would on a hiking trip, um, you know, because you need to be able to move quickly and carefully and stealthily to some degree. Um, and in that situation, you would want to have um, stockpiles and caches on your way, and you want to be able to plan that ahead of time because you can't carry everything you need. It's impossible. Um, so... Uh, things like that uh, become really important in terms of, like, you know, thinking about moving nomadically and all that kind of stuff. We're going to pick up that topic in the second hour, logistics, safety, and security. we got another 15 minutes to talk about health, hygiene, and water. And, Leah, you bring up inner city. <clears throat> if you're living in a city or a, an urban area, uh, you should be stockpiling water because if infrastructure fails, you're going to need water to stay in place for a few days. If you're on an upper floor, those pipes not, might not be pumping anymore. So what you want to do is have several seven-gallon containers in a cold, dark place, like in a closet, at least 21 gallons or more of water for emergency situations. If you know an event or a major storm may damage the infrastructure, you want to fill your tub. You also want to know where the hot water heater is because there's going to be 35 to 50 gallons of water in that heater that you can use if you have no access to water. There's also water behind every toilet in that tank. It's safe to drink if you boil it and safe to use for cooking. These are all things that if, if what I'm telling you is new to you, you are not even close to being ready for the coming times. So any other tips on hygiene or water in cities, out of cities, that we can sum up in the next 15 minutes, Anita? I'd say be prepared to collect rainwater. Look through your house and see what you have that will hold water, buckets, uh, cans, pots and pans, and, and, and actually sit down and figure out how much water you could collect the next time it rains. Remember that snow, when it melts down, 
uh, 10 to 12 inches of snow will make one inch of water. So you'd have to collect a heck of a lot of snow to get good drinking water. Leah, what do you think? I, I completely agree. Um, you know, you can also store water in your bathtub. And, uh, you know, as Diamond said, having a supply of water, if you're in that situation, is tremendously important. Um, and it's important for everybody. Make sure you have water. It's, you're not going to make it without it. Um, I also wanted to mention, too, the importance in terms of health of fat. Um, fat, I believe, is going to be tremendously important. Um, you know, one thing people should be aware of is they're stockpiling supplies. If you're gathering freeze-dried food, freeze-dried food doesn't have any fat in it because it goes rancid. Um, so you have to have other things that contain fat, like you can stockpile cans of tuna and oil and peanut butter and anything else. And I also believe this is a really important reason to have animals. And it's not just for health. It's also for soap and candle making and fuel for heating and light. Um, and Dr. Bailey, you pointed out in your book, which I wasn't even thinking about, it's really important for skin care um, because a, a bad, you know, a, um, really dry skin because of cold can essentially become a wound and get infected. Um, that becomes really important, as is protein and carbs. And, you know, back to the fat uh, thing, I mean, I don't think anyone should expect um, in, in hard and cold times that they're going to stay average or even overweight. I think that's really unlikely. Um, I also wanted to mention, um, like, um, Dr. Bailey, you have a an, an, um, really great list of medical supplies in your book, and I really appreciate it because there's a lot of things on that list that I wasn't really thinking about. Um, and there's, you know, just having the supplies, um, things like iodine and bandages and sutures. Um, it came to my attention recently, too, that you can go on Amazon and you can buy practice suturing kits. Um, this is just a basic, you know, piece of first aid that you probably will have to implement at some point. Um, it comes with a fake arm that you sew up, right? Yeah, basically. Well, it comes with uh, you know fake wounds, but it, but it comes with a layer that the layers that represent skin and fat and and muscle tissue, so you can get a feel for how that works. Um, in fact, I'm going to order one myself, and this is something I should already know how to do anyway. Uh, you can also take um, courses in street medicine or field medicine. Um, I did take a field medicine course, a brief one at one time. Um, and I learned a lot, like, uh, you know, just how to make splints and tourniquets, and I need to review how to do those things. Um, there's some medical supplies that you can, you can be resourceful, and, and uh, uh, as in one example, in this particular field course, there are, there's a particular kind of dressing called the chest seal that's meant for sucking chest wounds. However, the medical version of a chest seal is extremely expensive and I was told doesn't even work very well. And the person who was running this course figured out a way how to make one very inexpensively out of plastic file folders and some other materials. So those are all things you can prepare ahead of time and have in your first aid kits. Um, also, um, uh, interestingly, and this is applicable to everyone, but um, also to women, uh, Collecting um, supplies for menstruation, tampons and sanitary napkins are fantastic for dealing with bleeding wounds. And I would say don't use them for menstruation needs. Learn how to make fabric menstrual supplies instead. Save those materials for when you really need them for a medical emergency. Um, there's all kinds of things that you can stockpile or not, and many of them can, you can find replacements for, but in some cases the medical version is the best thing. You know, it's like uh, we, we're talking about antibiotics, and it would be wonderful if everything in nature could treat infections the way that we do in the first world, but that's not the reality, and sometimes antibiotics are really necessary. So having a stockpile of something like a broad-spectrum antibiotic, like uh, amoxicillin in the form of fish mox, becomes pretty important. 
Yeah, I can't implore enough that if you're listening out there and you're wondering what you can do to start getting prepared and you live in a populated area, a major city or a suburb, there's a YMCA near you that at least two, three times a year has CPR training, first aid. It only costs 20, 30 bucks to take the class. It's usually a few nights. They offer these for lifeguards. There's also swift water rescue and other white water and other safety courses that get offered starting with the first aid course. So go to a CPR or a first aid course, and then you can learn out of, about all the other advanced courses you can learn about, which will save your life in the coming times, because you're not going to be able to go to the emergency room. Your neighbor isn't necessarily going to be a surgeon, which ours is, but <laughs> <laughs> you're going to need maybe to set a broken bone. You're going to need to sew up a wound or you will die. And these courses will tell you how to revive a heart and how to act uh, clear an airway, you know, make a trach out of a big pen. These are things that you should probably know uh, in the coming times because they may just save your life. Uh, do you have any other courses or suggestions that you can suggest to the listeners for preparedness as far as um, medical concerns? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Uh, as uh, Leah pointed out, I think it was Leah, you can go online and search up your suture materials. Some sites um, will have expired suture material where you can practice on the cheap, otherwise it's fairly expensive. Um, and that will give you some, some really good practice time. Uh, use the, the little fake arm and skin wounds and what have you they send, but then progress on to uh, chicken thighs with the skin on and see how the skin reacts. Um, the skin is a lot more forgiving when you're doing suturing than fabric is. Um, and so you can, you can pull it tight and, and ease it out in a way that you just can't do with fabric. So that's, that's kind of an interesting experience. Any kind of suturing you have to do, the most critically important thing is clean the wound. Make it a point that that becomes part of your practice, that you clean the wound. If you're using a piece of chicken leg, shove some dirt in it. Mess it up really good and, and then start cleaning it with clean water. That's all you need. doesn't have to be sterile, just clean water. And flush it until all of the bits of junk are out of there because one little piece of dirt left in a wound like that that you have sewed shut is an invitation to a horrible infection, just horrible, or tetanus. So just make sure your wounds are very thoroughly clean. And when you close them, pull the skin so that it is kind of up to a peak so that the torn edges meet. You don't want it flat. You want the fleshy, torn parts to meet because that's where the blood flow is, where the, the life force is, if that makes any any sense. I'm here. If you could see my hands, you could see exactly <laughs> how to do it. Um, uh, what was the other thing? I wanted to hit another point. I should be taking notes on this because we're covering a huge amount of really good ground. Uh, okay. Fish amoxyl fish mox is amoxicillin. Yes. There are other fish remedies, uh, fish pen, uh, which is penicillin, and uh, fish, fish pro or fish cipro, something like that, and that is ciprofloxacin. Now, in the Ooh. book, it's got that. You can look them up online. They're all good medications with more specific uses. Amoxicillin is good for certain things. Cipro is good for other things. Uh, penicillin is broad-based. Um, amoxicillin and penicillin will lose potency over time, even refrigerated. So you may have to increase the dose rate. Cipro seems to be stable for a long time, even well past its expiration. Um, there were some studies the military performed, and they found it could go on 10 years past expiration and function almost as well as fresh Cipro. So mm, and Cipro is used for huge uh, infections like anthrax and MRSA, correct? Anthrax, yes, very much. MRSA, it, it depends on the area that you're in and what has been used and overused in the recent past. Oh. Um, so it, 
you kind of have to know. Now, MRSA is very responsive to garlic poultices. Something mm-hmm. that dumb mm-hmm. will will fix it up. But you've got to have somebody who's willing to continually poultice the, the MRSA boils with a, a garlic uh, concoction in order to, to take it. And, okay, this is way off on the side here, but I had a patient <laughs> once who had a terrible reoccurring case of, of the MRSA skin boils, and we tried everything on her, nothing worked, and in desperation one evening, she just sprayed herself down with Lysol. And she said it, it really stung badly, <laughs> but she had improvement from it. And so, I mean, it's unconventional, but for her it worked. I do not recommend this. I don't know of any no. study that have looked at it. But when you're desperate, you do what you need. Awesome. Well, there's the commercial guy. Stick with us. In the second half, we're going to be talking about the important stuff, security, logistics, and preparedness on the second half of The Inconvenient Truth, prepping for the mini ice age. Join us, won't you? into a world unseen on Raven Star's Witching Hour. You will encounter eclectic topics from the realm of spirit brought into our matrix of truth. With your host, the Solaris Blue Raven. Solaris will bring you an array of unique guests covering topics from ghostly spirits to amazing anomalies, covert technology, UFOs, and shadowy global events. And that's right here at Revolution Radio FreedomSlips.com, Saturdays, midnight till 2 a.m. Eastern Time. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Let the magic rise. <laughs> Join me weekdays for my new show, Tell Chris Joe. It's going to be a problem show brought to you live from Kensington. Thursdays, I'm dealing with hot topics, heated debate, what's new around the world, and ring-ins to discuss listeners' problems and offering considered and heartfelt solutions. So join me, Chris Hart, for Tell Chris Joe. Stop what you're doing, grab a cup of tea, and coming live from Kensington, relax. Let me entertain you with a coffee bar online. Listeners, very personal problems. So that's Thursdays, 2 p.m. in the afternoon, Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. See you there. It's going to be lots of fun. This is Barbara DeLong, host of Nightlight Radio, inviting you to join me on a cosmic journey. Exploring a metaphysical montage of spiritual material, covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between, including spiritual readings for those who seek enlightenment. Let Nightlight provide you with equal measure of light, love and laughter, insight, wisdom, and inspiration. Monday nights, 10 to 12 p.m. Eastern, right here on Studio B, Revolution Radio, at freedomslips.com. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. 
Welcome back, everyone. It's Diamond from the Oppenheimer Ranch Project with the second hour of The Inconvenient Truth, prepping for the mini Ice Age with Anita Bailey, Ph.D., author of Cold Times, and Leah Shaper, my partner in crime over here at the Oppenheimer Ranch Project. We're finishing up our March Preparedness Month, discussing the uh, prepping for the mini Ice Age with Anita Bailey and going through her book chapter by chapter. Uh, we're going to finish up the final hour of this four-week discussion bringing it all together, talking about safety and security and the big picture questions, logistics, how is this going to happen and how am I going to be safe? Um, Anita, welcome back and can you give us a little synopsis on your ideas on safety, security, and logistics? Well, the, the primary issue is location. It's always location. If you're in a urban setting, your needs for security and safety are going to be different than somebody who's in the backwoods in Idaho. Uh, one of the most dangerous animals of all under duress is a human being. So we we need to to be clear on what our needs are and what our motivations are. Um, it, to my mind, a decent person uh, is not anxious to go out and cause trouble. They want to protect their family and, and their environment and their community and avoid putting anyone in a situation where they are in danger. That's kind of the big picture. Now, the problem is we don't know what's going to happen. So to my mind, planning for the worst case scenario takes care of everything. It handles all the, the problems in between. And I, I tried to do that in the book, but it's hard to know exactly how to advise people when even the, the mere thought that they could be under a life-threatening situation is, is so repugnant that people won't even go there mentally. Now, once again, I have another theory on why that is, uh, aside from, from denial. Uh, and that is that, once again, we've been programmed by movies. We've been told that the hero always wins in the end. So we have this, this initial programming that has been fed to us for our entire lives, first from television, and second, from the movies, that you do everything right, and it all comes out in the end. It's okay. And we always see ourselves as the hero. So when, when you start to plan, you start to think about this concept, uh, one of the big steps that you can take is to say that reality doesn't care about you. It's not going to bring in the cavalry right at the last moment. Uh, the helicopter isn't going to come down and pull you out of the problem. And if you can start from the position that whatever happens depends on me being competent and prepared to handle it, that takes you into the mindset where you can begin building. Uh, a really excellent book is, uh, now if I could remember the name, uh, Oh, golly, I was just thinking of it. And I mentioned it in my book. Uh, um, well, I'll think of it in a moment. When there is a societal breakdown and you're in an urban setting, or suburban, let's say, that's probably better, you're, it, it's community. It's back to community. You need to know your neighbors, know their skills, and be able to bring them together to... Uh, to provide the security you need because everybody sleeps. And when you sleep, you can't do the hard work out there. Uh, and nobody can do everything on their own. Uh, okay. Uh, fire safety is a critical item. And once again, that's something we have developed this mindset that that is something that other people handle for us. I mean, if there's a fire in your apartment building 
and there's no fire department to come and fix it, what happens? Well, it probably burns down. And that's just the reality of, of, of that kind of a setting. Um, in the same way, if a tree falls on your house, you better be able to take care of it yourself if you can't call on somebody to come and repair it for you, a roofer or a repairman or whatever. So these are the, the steps, is, is beginning to think this through and figure out exactly what you need for your particular setting. Um, I do mention dogs in the book. I think dogs are, are a very, very useful adjunct to your security and safety. And there is some evidence that humans utilize dogs in, in the cave days and way back when, not so much for hunting, but as an alarm system. Even, even the least useful dog will usually bark if there's a stranger there. Okay. So a dog can be your initial alarm system and let you know something's different. Um, I want to have people try to think ahead in 10, 15 years if things really go bad, if we have the kind of cold we're expecting. Dogs will become a luxury item because they eat what a person could eat and they may become a food source for other people who are really hungry. So. In my mind, you want dogs that can reproduce because you're going to need puppies. You're going to need to replace your dogs. And once again, it's a hard thing for people to take that step mentally. Um, I had a question that came in uh, from someone who wondered how to handle moving and prepping when you have a partner who doesn't want to hear it or maybe they <laughs> can't hear it, uh, is so resistant they'll fight you on it. There, there's something going on there, and once again, I think we're looking at a cultural programming, and when, when you take the step to say, I may not be safe here, it cracks the cosmic egg in a big way. And it means a realignment of a huge number of internal beliefs that some people really aren't willing to do. Now, alternatively, you can be in a situation where that becomes a power struggle between partners in a relationship where, where uh, one says, gosh, things are going to get bad, and the other exerting their power says, no, they're not. Grow up. You know, don't be such a worry ward. So it, it, you kind of have to look at your own setting and and recognize whether your partner is is afraid to break through into that threatening realm where the universe is not your friend, where there isn't a security and safety net around you that will pick you up every time you fall down. That's, that's pretty scary. Uh, additionally, I think that's, that's partially why people have such a hard time with GSM, because it says people don't control everything. We're not in control. There are things that could hurt us that we have no ability to affect. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that's pretty scary. Yeah, and God forbid you should be actually prepared for, for in the event of an eventuality. So there's really nothing wrong with learning how to be resourceful, going camping, learning all these skills, stockpiling six months, seven, eight months, a year of food in the basement just in case. Because in the event that nothing happens, then who cares? You're so much for the better for it. Maybe you have extra food to donate to the church or, uh, you know, the local food bank in the future. There's nothing bad that can come from you learning new skills and being prepared in case a catastrophe occurs. Sure. And right. into every, every life, there's a little rain. You can lose your job. You can fall and break your leg. You can be in a situation 
that doesn't mean the end of the world or the end of society or even serious cold affecting you and still need your stored food supplies. Leah, I agree with... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I totally agree that, uh, you know, the cultural, cultural programming part of this um, is a very strong element to resistance. Um, and this, uh, I'm going to call it dependence on the cavalry, as you called it. Uh, it's like we've been trained to believe that we cannot take care of ourselves and that we should not. Now, granted, there are lots of situations where um, it is better to call in the experts. Um, I'm thinking of one particular experience that I had with fire in an apartment building that I was living in. Somebody had started a grease fire and had gotten into the walls, and the person who started the grease fire tried to put it out with a fire extinguisher. It didn't work. You know, fortunately, they figured out, like, oh, I really need to call the fire department. Um, you know, in that situation like that, there really is a limit to how much you as an individual or your, just your family can do, um, and you might just have to take the loss at that point. Um, but this is all part of being flexible and um, that you can't prepare for anything, but there is no harm in doing so. Um, uh, before we moved where we are now, uh, we were on the East Coast, uh, living in Philadelphia, and I had already prepped quite a bit, and I probably had about a year's worth of food in my basement and a fair amount of water and fuel and a number of other things, and I'm sure I was lacking tons of stuff as well. Um, and definitely when I talked to people about this, I encountered a lot of looks like, you're kind of crazy, and um, in particular this question that's like what's what are you worried about and what's wrong with you and it's like there's nothing wrong with me i'm looking at the possibilities for the future at the time i was not thinking about grand solar minimum but i was thinking about things like the potential for financial collapse which may occur with grand solar minimum anyhow and probably will um but somehow uh it was generally unacceptable to people that i was doing this um, which is sort of a strange thing. Um, and then, you know, um, Dr. Bailey, you just touched as well, again, on the importance of community for security. Um, the reality is no man is an island. Um, again, we are social creatures for a reason. Human beings need each other, just like dogs need each other in packs. Um, and so to to be able to talk to your neighbors and maybe work out some kind of community plan um, for security that's very specific to where you are and the circumstances right there is critical. Um, there's no one-size-fits-all security solution, so you really have to kind of think in advance about this because none of this is stuff that can be done on the fly. Yeah, and now if you go out and talk to your neighbor and he's not down with what you're saying, what you've just done is revealed that you're preparing for an event, and now your neighbor has become your enemy. So there are lots of logistical things to think about moving forward. And the number one thing you advocate for, Anita, is don't tell anyone if you're stockpiling supplies. It's kind of like Fight Club. You just don't <laughs> talk about Fight Club. Um, the book I was trying to think of is A Failure of Civility. Excellent, excellent book, really good for the suburban setting, helps you think about how to, to, to set up uh, an environment of safety there. So uh, how would you handle uh, moving and prepping with a partner who doesn't want to hear about it? I think we see this a lot. Mm. That's a very tough question to answer. <laughs> I don't know. I honestly don't know how someone would do this on their own with that kind of resistance, um, because it seems like your only option at that point is to do it without them knowing. And I think you said this, Dr. Bailey. That's not really, it's it's not really a very viable solution. Um, I I mean, I guess you can try your best to convince them that this is the right thing, and maybe you convince them that you're going to do it anyway and they don't have to take part um, and that way that person will at least know that if something happens their preparations have been made um, I honestly beyond that I don't know and 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 maybe the answer is it's not the right relationship 
Yeah, you better be doing it for the kids at that point. Yeah. Uh, you can you can fall back on the, honey, this is my hobby. This makes me happy to know that I've got extra cans of this and that. Uh, you've got your hobby, golf, which I think is really dumb, but you can have <laughs> yours and mine. And you can, there's, there's, oftentimes there's a way where I, I think personally you don't want to hide something from your partner, but you can present it in a way that, makes it palatable, um, and that's always the challenge. Uh, once again, you watch the news together and you see these storms going on on the East Coast and the power's out. Well, honey, what do you think we would do if the power went out? Well, how would we cook? Hmm, maybe we ought to consider like a camp stove or something. And, and so you can bring it into the conversation and, and make it so that it's not threatening. It doesn't mean that, that you know, you're going to die if, if you don't cook a meal. But it, it makes it so that it's palatable to someone who is otherwise resistant. And once they see that it was helpful a couple of times, oh, well, I'm glad you put back that water because when the boil order came, we didn't have to boil water. We had plenty. Wasn't that great? So you get a little bit of little bit of a, a reinforcement there for it. How's that? Uh, I'm done. Yes. <laughs> um, those are those are all great ideas, you know, taking essentially taking advantage of, you know, real situations that do stir up, you know, it would be certainly um, helpful for someone to realize that you know, in a particular moment that they actually needed the thing that, that their, their partner or spouse actually provided. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also very glad that you mentioned dogs, particularly working dogs or guardian dogs. Um, that's something I have been thinking about, and I wish I could find, get, find it, but we have an excellent book about guardian animals in general, um, and it focuses heavily on dogs, but also talks about llamas and donkeys. I believe it's a, um, one of the stories guides. That's S-T-O-R-E-Y, the excellent stories guide. And I don't remember exactly the name of it, but it, if you look up stories in guardian animal, animals, it would surface. This book is geared more towards protecting livestock, but it does um, give an excellent description of what a working dog does. And to my mind, uh, a working dog helps solve a lot of other problems in a way that dog is a lookout and an alert system. Um, guardian dogs are different than a, a pet dog. Um, you know, they don't play with you. They don't sleep in your house. Their job is to work, and, 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 and they work for reward. And the reward is not so much human affection, um, but um, a job well done. Um, there's a, we have a neighbor down the road here who has a couple of guardian dogs, and I was very impressed uh, when we first moved here to see um, this dog just watching our truck. You know, we'd move the truck forward five feet, and his gaze would shift, and it was simply because we were out of the ordinary. Our truck was unfamiliar, and so he just kept watch. You know, I'm watching, I'm watching, and then at any, um, any moment, it, let's say, had we become a threat, I'm sure that that dog would have alerted uh, its owners. Um, and that seems like a very good solution f as an alert system, and I, I really I, I like that, and I wonder if you could speak more on that topic. Yeah, I'm, I'm very fond of dogs. The ones that we have right now are uh, one quarter Great Pyrenees, one quarter Bloodhound, and half Standard Collie. So they're, they're big dogs. They have a lot of variable genetics. They're naturally healthy, and they do the job here. They behave more like the guardian uh, in that they will be up all night checking around, running around, looking and sniffing, and sleeping during the day than they do the collie or the, the bloodhound. So that I'm, I'm very pleased to see that coming along in there. Uh, their size makes them intimidating to strangers. And, however, they're not vicious or aggressive dogs. They seem to be very sensible. So this is a cross that I like. Um, we're proceeding to bring in um, a little bit of pit bull into the line as well to 
add in a little bit more of the personal family protective nature. So I don't know if that's going to work out. Uh, we we acquired a pit bull that was just dropped off. It was a, you know one of those dogs that just shows up way out in the country. So you know somebody drove out and said, "That's it, Fido, you're out of here." And uh, he turned out to be a very very good dog. Uh, so uh, you just look at what you've got and see what you need and look for those traits. Uh, dogs are a hard topic for a lot of people because. They've been turned into children by our culture, and so when we we have a dog, we don't say, "What are this animal's working characteristics that will benefit me and my family?" We look at the dog and we go, "Oh, so cute!" And we want to cuddle it and bring it in the house, and it sleeps in the bed. And that's from the past. That's from the 20th century. We're moving into the 21st century, where that dog is a worker on your property, it has a job to do, and sometimes its job is just being your buddy, you know. But at the same time, you want it to perform a function so that it can justify the food that you're going to be feeding it. It's, it's a hard step. It's a hard step for a lot of people. Guardian dogs are, are probably the way to go. There's some that are a little bit more uh, human protective, um, but uh, by and large, you raise them out with your livestock, and that livestock becomes their family, and that's what they do. All dogs need a job, by the way. That is in their nature. They must have a job. And if you don't give them a job, they'll give themselves a job. So your your house pet that goes crazy when the mailman shows up has assigned itself a job. This is my job. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of a lot of mutts from the pound are great uh, watchdogs because they're loyal to their owners, and and they're mutts. I find mutts in general that are mid-sized dogs make great watchdogs. They'll bark at other people, but not necessarily bite them. Um, mm -hmm. They're good protectors and uh, good alarm systems. Yes, yeah, which is a, a a perfect use for a dog. They they pay for themselves many times over by letting you know that. Something is amiss out there. Yeah, and they're mostly free. You can go to the pound and you can adopt one, a mutt. There's lots of them. <laughs> they're finding them every day. Let's talk about some interesting stuff. Let's talk about weapons. Mm -hmm. Weapons are going to be key. Uh, in North America especially, everyone has guns. Some countries there's not a lot of guns or there's no guns at all. But in this country, there are millions and millions of rifles shotguns and handguns so when the event occurs grid down situation no more food at the stores you've got your community together you are going to need security and that's going to involve logistical training people that work in shifts maybe you have a town watch but it is also going to involve weapons anita can you give us a synopsis on uh, your feelings uh, on the security issue as it relates to weapons. Well, you're absolutely right. If you can't get on the phone and call 911 and have the uh, police show up in a few minutes or however long it takes for them to get there, you're on your own. Uh, even today in the part of the country you live in, uh, somebody did a study, and they said that if you're, you're living in the suburbs 14 times a day, somebody drives past your home and scopes it out, for a potential robbery. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know where they get these statistics, but the idea is that you're not necessarily safe, even though you may think you are. Now, a lot of people have become alert to this idea and have security systems, but if your security system consists of a camera, then you get a picture of the bad guy while they're busting down your door. <laughs> You really have to begin thinking in the way of, how can I handle this? I don't want to handle this. Um, I didn't start shooting until I was probably in my early 50s because I was afraid of guns. Honest to goodness, those things are loud, and if you touch them, they go off, and if you try to shoot them, they're probably going to explode in your hands. I mean, this is what I had in my head. I don't know where I got it because... I wasn't I wasn't raised with people who were afraid of guns. We did we just didn't have them. Um, and when I took the um, 
a little course to prepare to get a concealed carry, there was another older lady in there as well, and we sat together and consoled each other with how horrible it was that we even had to think of carrying a gun. And she was just as afraid to hold it and, and use the weapons as I was. Well, I got to tell you, the first time shooting and hitting the target over and over, apparently I just have good natural aim, was such a high. Uh-huh. I was hooked. Man, this is great. It's a video <laughs> that's really loud and it's tactile. It goes boom and, and you feel it. And the bigger gun you're you're using, the bigger pistol that you're holding, the bigger the boom is. <laughs> and, and it, you know, uh, by golly, I discovered a side of myself I didn't know I had, the, the crazy gun nut. So uh, the writers on preparedness usually say, and, and I agree with this entirely, is that you need three basic types of weapons. You need a handgun for close work. For you're out and you're in the garden and there's a snake, you want to be able to dispatch that thing so you don't end up bit or somebody else gets bit. Uh, and your handgun is right there. You can use it right now and problem solved. Uh, you need a rifle, and that's for long-distance things such as hunting. And you need a shotgun because it has a big pattern where if you're under duress, that what they call the, the household protection, you can just point it in the direction and pull the trigger. And a shotgun, especially if you're in a suburban area, it d- doesn't have the extreme penetration through your neighbor's house that a rifle would have or even a handgun. So shotgun is good for home defense, rifle good for hunting, pistol for emergency, uh, up-close situations. And, and that's a, a good basic starting point. If you have no experience with, with uh, firearms whatsoever, go down to your nearest uh, shooting range and tell them, I don't know anything. What do I need to, to know? And you will meet a whole bunch of people who are very excited to share their knowledge with you and will just be thrilled that you have, have uh, decided to take this step. Gun enthusiasts are quite enthusiastic. (laughs) Dr. Bailey, I think you do a great job in your book of kind of giving a real lay of the land, um, particularly in regard to, well, security overall and and firearms in particular. I I agree with everything you just said, and I I was sort of chuckling to myself as you were talking because um, describing your evolution into firearms is actually quite similar to my own. Um, I also did not grow up with firearms, and I wasn't uh, particularly afraid of them, but I had some notion that it was wrong or bad or whatever. I don't know what it was exactly. Um, And later I was introduced into firearms, and it turns out that I love them. Um, And and basically, you know, a very similar experience. Um, Having good natural aim, it got me excited about it, Um, and then I started learning a lot more. But um, I feel like the critical thing when, when it comes to firearms is training, 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 particularly in safety. Um, you know, under duress, you're not going to be able to just pick up a shotgun or a pistol or whatever it is and expect to be able to use it. There's no way. Um, you're certainly not going to be able to use it effectively. There's lots of other skills that, you know, you can... You can, if you feel overwhelmed by prepping for the Grand Solar Minimum, there's lots of skills that you can collect books on and you can actually learn later. Um, if you want to learn how to spin wool or knitting or sewing or shoemaking or canning, whatever it is, you may need to collect supplies, but if you need time, you can do that later. This is a different beast. This is something you have to train for ahead of time um, to know what the safety rules are, to know really how to use it. Um, And then the other things that you need to figure out is which firearms work well for you. Um, I, um, um, you know, considering um, the availability of ammunition and their popularity is important. I feel like 9mm is a great round for a lot of people simply because it's ubiquitous and it's everywhere and you can always get your hands on it. 
Um, but it might not be what you shoot best with. And that's perhaps the most important um, part to consider is what you shoot well with. Um, you know, there's a lot of advice, a lot of advice from gun enthusiasts out there about which firearms are the right ones and which is the right ammo. And there's some good advice in there, but mostly those are opinions. And the best choice comes down to what it is you can handle. Um, the, the, the sort of trifecta of rifle, pistol, shotgun, I couldn't agree more. Um, if you're in a in a, um, if you're in a sort of populated area um, and you're working to protect your house from inside your house, as far as a shotgun, I think having a pistol grip is a great way to go because it gives you some flexibility in moving around your house effectively. Um, um, and I'll also say, too, that um, you know, I, I know AR-15s get a lot of uh, crap. Both um, They get positive and negative feedback. But I really believe that it can be a really good all-around firearm for both defense and hunting. Um, and if you go that route, I would advise getting a, a gas piston AR-15 versus a direct impingement model, simply because a gas piston AR-15 can tolerate dirty conditions a little better and doesn't require a whole lot of cleaning, and it runs cooler. Um, and if you can't afford a gas piston AR-15, you may be able to swap receivers with a gas impingement model. There's a lot of things to consider in here, and it really deserves some, some research and especially experience and training and getting trained to shoot at a range and taking self-defense courses and hunting courses and all of that kind of stuff. And it's really something you have to think about ahead of time. You can't expect that you're going to be able to pick up and just defend yourself in a second. Mm -hmm. Very, very true, and uh, emphasizing that whole safety aspect. It's, yeah. it's very common when people first pick up a weapon for the first time that they're, they're not alert to where the weapon is pointing. And so you can, you can sweep that barrel past other people, and <laughs> the risk of, of that is extremely dangerous. So you have to be conscious of where that thing is pointing and make sure you're not pointing it at someone, pointing it at your dog. Uh, you want to make sure that it is in a position where you're not going to accidentally pull that trigger. And that's you keep your finger off the trigger, lay it beside the trigger guard all the time until you are ready to actually pull the trigger. Don't point your weapon at anything you're not willing to destroy. And, and this is this is the safety skills that you'll learn in any good course, and uh, gun enthusiasts will lead you through this process. Very very good, uh, real good advice on the on the AR. ARs are wonderful uh, weaponry for ladies or smaller statured men as well because they're not huge big clunky things. Uh, they're lightweight, uh, easy to aim easy to carry around on a sling comparatively compared to, to a, a large rifle of some kind. So just it's, it's a very personal thing. Uh, some people like Glocks. They're not comfortable in my hand. I like the Walther. So it, it's just it's a very personal thing. If, if you have tried a particular kind of weapon and you're comfortable with it, then go with it. If it doesn't make any difference, you then then try to have everyone in your group or at least your family uh, utilize the same type of weapon. So it's it's like anything else. Some people like chocolate. Some people prefer vanilla. You just got to <laughs> find for you and and stick with that. Yeah, all excellent advice. Yeah, take a safety class. Go to a concealed carry course. Go to the shooting ground and find that gun enthusiast and learn that the front area of all guns, whether they be handguns or rifles, is where things die. And you want to be really vigilant on where that barrel is pointing. That is the number one thing on my mind all the time. Even when I'm holding a BB gun, you know, it's just a BB gun, but that's always pointing away from things that can die. Also, you know, you were just talking about how shotguns are important because they don't penetrate and kill your neighbors if you're in an apartment building. 
bullets travel for very long distances. We had a senile neighbor here just come out every night and unload his pistol into the sky in various directions. And I had to go tell him, I'm like, John, there's people that live here and bullets fall back down to earth. And he was under the impression that it was just a pea shooter, a 22, and it's not going to hurt anybody. Th- that is a very bad impression, especially when you're senile. <laughs> <laughs> so learn about the safety, uh, ins- safety about the weapons you're buying. Learn how to use them properly. Learn how to not point them at things that will die. And keep your finger off the trigger. Yeah, because so, uh, until you learn the weapon, some triggers are, you know, hairline. Bar- you barely touch them and they fire a bullet. Some you have to pull very hard on. So learning the ins and outs of the weapon that you're purchasing and that you're going to use for uh, s- securing your food, maybe if you're getting wild game, or protecting you in a situation where someone's coming for your things very important to be very familiar with the weapon and comfortable using it. I always say proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. In the case of weapons, it prevents you killing your wife, neighbor, or friend, and yourself. Uh, It's very important to learn the safety aspects of weapons. Now, Anita, we only have 25 minutes here, and it's coming to a close, so I before we sum this all up, I want to tell everyone, if they're looking for your book, to simply find it on our YouTube channel beneath one of her interviews where, and any one of our videos that we, we put up. We have the Oppenheimer Ranch special. It's at octoritaspublishing.org backslash specials, where you can pick up her book for $14.95, over 20% off the cover with free shipping in the U.S. And someone just told me this morning they ordered it on the 23rd, and it got there on their doorstep on the 27th. And they were like, boom. (laughs) So good job getting that book out to the people that need it, Anita. Now let's talk about what happens. So how do, let's think about this. Um, The event happens. Let's say the grid goes down. Or let's say we're in California and the big earthquake occurs and all San Francisco's on fire. Or we live in Indonesia and Mount Agung just exploded, VEI-7, and the sky's getting dark. Uh, What do we do next? Get out. (laughs) (laughs) You mean we don't want to take out our cell phones and get a selfie? (laughs) Well, that's a start. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah th- those, are, those are the tragic events that we all hope we never go through, and yet somebody's going to go through it. Uh, hopefully they have prepared their, their bug-out bag, and they can access it. It's in the trunk of their car. It's in their desk at work. It's in a closet at home. They can grab it and go. You, you just really... If, if you're in a situation where you're living under a volcano that is rumbling and, and putting out steam and has a history of blowing up during uh, grand solar minimums, you're, you're, you're tempting fate. You're saying, I'm ready to die. <laughs> so it, this is the, the part where reality doesn't care about you. It doesn't care about your feelings. It doesn't care that you think you're going to be the hero of the movie of your life. Because when the rocks start raining down or the building is falling down around you, your time's up. It's just up. Um, Ideally, months before you have looked at your situation and made an informed, rational decision that this isn't the place I need to be. And that, once again, that informed, rational decision comes out of an assessment of reality and being willing to say that the risk is here. We, we do that when we buy house insurance. We say there's a risk that my house could burn down uh, or the mortgage company makes you buy it. Uh, <laughs> Same thing with health insurance. If, if you're not compelled to buy it, you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm willing to bet that something could happen to my health and I'm going to spend the money to make sure that I have an alternative. Well, it's like storing food is insurance against any calamity where food may not be available, including being out of work. 
So in the same way, you're living under that volcano or near a dam that's had problems and you're somewhere in the outflow area, you have to sensibly look at that and say, I have to, I can't live here. This is not a safe place. Uh, it's, that's, and that's a hard step. Uh, other than that, yep. I, I, I don't know what advice to give somebody. Leave now. Yep. There's millions of people that are in harm's way. They're either near uh, the Cascadia uh, volcanoes, fault zones, where, you know, the tectonic area on the entire west coast is well overdue from south of California all the way up through Oregon and Washington for major quakes that will tick off during the next 20 years, as they have every other single time. And that includes major volcanic eruptions. The New Madrid may and probably will fault with other major faults. We just talked about a 1755 historic earthquake that was in Boston that destroyed the whole city. I'm sure no one knows about that. Uh, you can find that out right from the mainstream, but mainstream media is not telling you about it. That's for certain. So events like this will be happening globally, and there are millions, tens of millions of people who don't have the resources to buy a ranch or to get 10 acres in the country. They're stuck in their job, in the rat race, putting money in their 401k, sending their kids to school and whatever they're doing. Those people can easily be searching for places to go and prepping that bug out bag. The bug out bag doesn't take much. You could slowly put it together with some food, some a first aid kit, some flashlights. Research what should be in a bug out bag and what you would need to go for a few days, maybe some emergency blankets, camping equipment, etc. Also have that in your car. But you need to be re researching relatives, friends and neighbors that have rural, remote areas where there might be some preparation going on. You'll never know if this hap is it happening unless you go look for it. What I shared on our channel was there is a bunch of intentional communities worldwide, whether they be for religious purposes or gardening or shooting guns or hunting or fishing, whatever they are. They have backwoods camps and groups of preppers. There's all different kinds. You can be researching these groups on the Internet, going to one of their meetups, and actually finding locations that you can actually bug out to. I would suggest that everyone be doing their own homework and find these locations. They're popping up all, worldwide everywhere for the reason we're having this discussion right now. And they've been in existence for decades, starting with the hippie movement, and the commune idea has been trying to be replicated on and on and on. Uh, so there are many resources where you don't you think you're stuck between a rock and a hard place and you have nowhere to go. There are many places you can go. You need to be thinking positive and progressive, baby steps, move forward, get it done. This is a new way of thinking. There are hundreds of thousands of people that have been prepping for decades. Locate them. You both brought up some really important points. Um, you know, I love the, the analogy with insurance. Um, you know, I, I, this is something I've thought about, and, you know, depending on the kind of insurance, if I, you know, if I just blindly buy some insurance because that's what I'm supposed to do or that's what's expected of me, well, that's not very thoughtful. Um, you know, I think it comes down to balancing risk and considering your 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 own situation which is going to be very different for everybody it's not just location dependent but it's also dependent on your personal resources you have two choices here you can either say but put your head in in the sand and and bury it and decide i don't want to deal with this or think about it or you can consciously decide which risks you're willing to take and really evaluate what is in front of you and if you do that, you'll then see that maybe you can make some changes and choices. Maybe instead of investing in your 401k, you can take that money and to put it into something that will help you prep in for your future, however it is that you decide to do that. Um, you know, uh, it's like, you know, when we were living in Philadelphia, yeah, we were prepped. 
to be able to get out if we needed to, and there was a plan to stay in place if something happened and then get out when we could. But in the long run, that was not what we wanted for ourselves, and that's not what we saw as a good long-term solution for us. So we left and we moved, and we're fortunate enough that we've been able to do that, and not everybody can. And I think that not, you know, not feeling, let's say, uh, financially able to, to make such a change can really like, propel a lot of people to, to put their heads in the sand, and that's really unfortunate. Um, you know, but, but like Diamond pointed out, too, you know, there's other things you can consider, other prepping communities. I mean, I know there's very specific people in my life who I've said to over the years, um, look, I'm not just here doing this for me. I'm doing this for you, too. And when things get bad, you need to get here. Um, and I hope you do. Um, it's, it's, you, you just have to decide what it is that you're willing to deal with and be realistic about what the consequences of those choices might be. And along with that idea, uh, the invitation to people, come here and, yeah. and you know, very few people will come alone. So if they're going to come, make sure you know that they're going to bring their best friend and their best friend's boyfriend or girlfriend and okay. somebody's mom and, and probably the neighbor who is so worried about things. So you may end up with a bigger crowd than you anticipate. Exactly. Um, it may be helpful in advance of this. If people know that you're prepping and you have a place and, and they're open to the idea of coming, encourage them to come out and help you plant the garden to invest in their future with you. Uh, come out on the day you butcher rabbit so they can help you do that. Um, or uh, better still, tell them, look, you're going to be here in case something happens. Why don't you store some food here? We'll go ahead and we'll put it in the pantry and we'll put your name on it and we won't touch it. Uh, unless you never show up, then probably we'll use it. <laughs> so the, you know, make these arrangements in advance. Somebody said uh, once that uh, people need a ticket to come into your place, and the ticket is labor or it's supplies. <laughs> and as as nasty as that may sound now, it gives them an incentive. They have a place that's secure, and they know that they have to do something to get in there. We all want to be generous with our friends and family, but when people come to your place, they have to know they're going to work there. They're not going to be a guest who gets their meals cooked for them. They're going to be cooking meals and cleaning the toilet. You understand what I'm saying? This isn't Absolutely. a free good. There's all a excellent. price for uh, your willingness to share. Even the, the, the only people, to my mind, who don't do something are people who are terribly sick, the invalids, uh, mentally disabled people who simply can't understand the concepts that you're trying to get across. Uh, everybody else works. Everybody contributes. And if they don't, then they're pulling your group down. Uh, That's exactly you know, why we have... Uh developed a very, we're trying to develop a very intentional community here, you know, that is based on, you know, input that people feel good about, um, that they want to take part in, because for the reasons you just stated, they're taking control of their future. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's, it's a challenging situation, and as time goes forward, we may find that we have to get more firm in how we deal with people, and, and that's the 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 challenge of setting up any kind of community like that, um, somebody's got to be in charge. And I would like to have a town hall kind of situation, but that doesn't always work in a uh, survival situation. Someone has to be able to make serious decisions quickly and very well informed. You have to know all of the factors uh, and people who haven't thought about these things come in with the baggage from their life in the city or their life elsewhere. Uh, let me create an imaginary scenario here. You're, you're out of food, you're out of meat, and you have this, the friend came in with their dog, and that's 
potentially the meal that's going to have everyone survive. Uh, the friend may not be willing to 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 give their dog over to keep everyone alive because they've never thought Fido is going to be on the menu. Uh, a good book, one one second after, I believe it is by William Force Forschen. Uh, which is about an EMP event, and and he deals with that issue of the beloved dog that, by golly, it's a terrible, sad thing, but your mindset changes. People who are hungry will do unthinkable things, unthinkable things. It happened on the Shackleton adventure. (laughs) The dogs were eaten. Sure. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yep. And historically... Horses have been food. Donkeys have been food. Well, dogs, of course, are uh, uh, traditional food of many people. Um, and, and we've been very sheltered from that in our country. Uh, I'd hate to eat a, a beloved horse or one of our dogs, but I would hate to see members of my family starve to death even more. Yeah, and the unfortunate scenario is that we are at a population density unprecedented in human history, and when global famine ensues, uh, we are going to see some very horrific things globally. And because of the nature of our technology, if it starts in a different part of the world than you're at, you're going to actually be able to watch it unfold. And I just... Uh, hope that if you are listening to the radio show now, you're doing everything in uh, in your ability to to prepare for uh, contingency plans for events that will unfold in the future. If history is a guide, please learn from it this time. These events have happened in the past; they will happen in the future. And we, uh, I'm not doing this radio program because I have a corporate sponsor or anyone's giving me money. Trust me, I could be watching Netflix or just doing anything else I want to be doing. This is uh, my humanitarian effort to warn the public of earth changes that will occur based on my experience, my scientific endeavors, my uh, historical studies. Uh, I've been looking at this in great detail. The evidence is mounting the facts and the predictions are coming true one after another. Mainstream science is picking up on it now, and papers are being published on the effects of solar cycles, the grand solar minimum we're entering, and the cosmic effects that are going to occur because our Earth's magnetosphere, the poles, they're flipping, and that results in a waning magnetosphere, which is happening, just so happens to be happening at the same time we're entering this grand solar minimum period. We are about to see weather events unprecedented manifest before your very eyes. They will continue to intensify, including hail at record levels, just like we saw in the uh, turn of the century back in 1801 in in London that led to the riots and the famines. So times are changing, and you can pick up on it. That's why you're listening to this. And if you're way ahead of the game, I hope that these conversations we've had for the last four weeks have helped you prepare for the events that you see and you know in your heart are about to happen. Now, none of us know the time frame for this, but it's very clear. The evidence is in. The crop failures are mounting. The snows are continuing to the end of March across North America. We have just had record snows in the Um, Sierra's, again, the month of March was records going back almost to the 80s. This is, uh, they had 13 foot of snow in 10 different resorts in three weeks. And that is matching massive record snows from the year prior. Uh, These are not anomalous things. These do not match up with the IPCC and global warming theory where everyone, there's never going to be snow anymore and we're all going to burn up and the sea level is going to rise. None of that is happening. What we are saying is going to happen, those events are happening. And we're seeing it before our very eyes, and now is the time to start preparing. There is a way to survive and thrive in the future. Uh, During the Great Depression, uh, we had an agrarian society. People were self-sufficient, self-reliant. They knew how to uh, 
improvise. We've lost that. So now's the time to start learning those skills so that we can come together as a community. We're not going to do this alone, but we're going to do it in groups. We're going to start from the ground up, and we're going to do it just like it has always done before. We need to get back to nature, and we need to stop relying on this false security that we call technology because it is totally inedible. Start learning how to grow food. The only way you can learn how to grow your own food to supply you and your family with the health and nutrition that they need is to fail. Ask any farmer. I have farmers contacting me. Diamond, thank you so much for saying start failing now or you'll never succeed because that's what you have to do. Guys, we just have a few minutes before we're ending up this awesome discussion. Um, if you have any final thoughts on the entire month uh, and the discussion about cold times and preparing for the mini ice age, I know, Leah, you'd only join us for this last convo, but if you guys have any general um, <coughs> synopsis or maybe you want to uh, one more cry to the public on how they can start preparing, um, do it now because uh, this will be the last time. Anita, you want to start? Yeah. Leah, first I want to thank you for joining us today. It's been a delight having you here, and, and thank you, Diamond, so much for giving me a platform here where I can reach out to people and encourage them to get on the ball here. One of the things that people can do, especially if this is a new concept to you, is to approach it with a beginner's mind. Don't come into it with a bunch of baggage that holds you back. Look at what you're learning and approach it as if, you are an infant or a child. It's new. It's got exciting aspects. It's got things that you've never thought of, and this opens a whole new world to you. Even someone who's advanced can learn something. So use that beginner's mind and move ahead with that. Leah? I completely agree with all of that. I, 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 it's been wonderful to be on the show and to talk with you, Dr. Bailey, um, so much of this can be incredibly overwhelming. I mean, we have a very good start, and it can still be overwhelming. But there are endless resources out there. You know, we still have an Internet. Um, there's tons of resources there, like our channel and, and so many other YouTube channels and uh, sites for prepping and homesteading. Um, even more important is to collect books. There is an immense amount of information available in books. Um, you can get discount books from thrift stores, from library discards, and none of this information that's regarding you know, homesteading and prepping and what you can do, none of it is ever out of date because it is based on the age-old wisdom of people who have gone through hard times before. Don't forget that human beings are incredibly resourceful and inventive, and that includes you. You don't have to be dependent on an empire model, and this is not hard stuff to learn. This is stuff that people learned by being resourceful and having to adapt and experiment because of hard times in the past. And you can gain that knowledge, and it will give you a ton of confidence to move forward and decide what is right for you to get ready. Awesome, guys. Thank you both for joining us. As the Grand Solar Minimum is upon us, you, both, you two are well aware, many of our listeners, as the total solar irradiance begins to decline, the world returns to the cold cycle as it has for the past 800,000 years. We're talking Arctic cold in some regions, crop failures, uh, massive flooding, huge hail, social catastrophes. We could be talking grid down scenarios. No one caused it. No one can fix it. You don't have to pay your taxes. That's not going to do it. All you can do is prepare. These are the words of Anita Bailey. I want to thank uh, Dr. Bailey for coming on our show for the entire month of March and really delving into her book piece by piece. Guys uh, listening out there, I hope you got something out of this month of preparedness. We're going to have Dr. Bailey back on in the future for roundtable discussions. More importantly, next month we're going to have Tony Rango on. He's going to be uh, talking about the chemtrail conspiracy uh, we've been having to block people. Uh, we are not chemtrail trail deniers, just like we're not climate deniers. The climate changes. We're scientists, so we take a pragmatic approach to the truth, and we're going to pick it apart using the facts. Geoengineering has been going on on the planet for decades. There are dozens of patents. There are cloud seeding projects, cosmic ray mitigation, solar mitigation projects. 
But most people are misidentifying simple contrails, which are on the... Um